Chris Totten. I'm the game artist in residence uh, at the American University Game Lab. I'm also part of the Department of Art in, uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I want to get started uh, here just because we have only 45 minutes and uh, time's a little limited, so I thought I'd get uh, going right away. Uh, this is Managing Project-Based Courses and Learning Outcomes with Game Like Syllabi. Long title, what does it mean? Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the things we're going to talk about today. To be honest, when I came up with the idea, or when I thought about doing a, uh, a discussion at Ann Farron, I was unsure of how best to approach this topic of game like syllabi. Um, on one hand, it's a very useful workshop uh, topic. On the other hand, you know, some of you may have never heard about this, so what's the point of doing a whole workshop if we haven't discussed sort of the theory of it first? Uh, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to try to get through my material very quickly, and then I'd like to have an open discussion about issues you've had, uh, things you're thinking about, and try to figure out how, um, instead of just me talking at you about these types of syllabi, let's talk about opportunities there are, because I'm still even learning about these. Um, I, as a game designer, I think a lot about play testing. Uh, the problem with game like syllabi is that each game session lasts an entire semester, so I'm still play testing my game. I'm still in, in what we would call alpha phase. Um, so I'm still developing things. Um, and I'm hoping that you know, we can all work together to uh, sort of figure these things out. So what are we going to talk about? Um, looks like a long list. I'm going to go through them very quickly and with lots of funny pictures. Um, so why, why do we need to try this? different type of syllabus out, so what, if, what is it about classes we need fix, uh, that needs fixing? Why are we trying a new method? Why are games a good method? Um, I've pointed out some systems that I've worked with um, in game like syllabi, and then I'll go through benefits and then risks and quote unquote bug fixing. So what are things that I'm noticing that need to be tried again, addressed, tweaked, things like that? So what about class needs fixing? Um, one thing that I have a problem with, and I know some of you may as well, is grades are something of a mystery to students. Now, there's the notion of, you know, yes, you should be updating your Blackboard with all the grades because it's just good to do, and then it saves you a bunch of work at the end of the semester. Um, but the students are still always nervous, like, how did I do? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing right? Um, there's one thing that's particularly wrong is often there's a lack of immediate feedback. I'm not just talking about grade your papers on time. I'm talking about this notion of, well, is my paper good? How do I know that? You know, what, what is it about what I'm doing in class? Um, you know, how am I going to get points for this? Uh, sometimes it can feel very subjective to a student. Um, so doing some research on this, research has actually found that students that do worse in classes will predict higher positive outcomes, and I've certainly had this. I've had students that have put in very little effort. Uh, I've given a C to them, and then they say, well, why did I get a C? I thought I was going to get an A for sure, because I predicted it. Um, so you see that happen in a lot of college courses. So then there's this other notion of, um, you know, as, as much as it seems like you shouldn't, because every semester you're starting with a clean slate. The popular notion among a lot of students, and this goes back to that, that quote, is that they perceive that they begin the semester with 100%. They perceive that they have an A. And, and you know, don't try to deny it, I've done it myself. You know, I did it when I was in school. So when they see their grade like this, and then that first bad paper comes, and then suddenly, they see their grade falling, but they feel like you know, they're drowning. They're trying to, to fix things, and they may realize uh, stuff is not going so well very late. Um, so there's different types of students. Research, uh, research has shown that there's different types of students, um, that, and different types of, uh, they look at their learning in different ways. Some are learning-oriented. Some really care about um, 
the, the work they're putting in and what they get out of that in an academic perspective. And then some are there just to get good marks, so they're grading oriented. So here, that's an issue. How do we create, uh, a lot of times the tasks we build for students are grading oriented. How can we build learning oriented uh, classwork while also you know, giving the grade oriented students, you know, those ones that are like, okay, what's due on when I need to add it to my, my Google calendar, you know, week one of school. Um, what are, how do we uh, serve them by giving them a good list of things that they can do to succeed in the course? And then of course, there's our friend, Mr. Lazy College Senior, um, or Lazy College Freshman, I don't know when they start drinking the Guinness. Um, Sometimes there's just not enough incentive to do things in class. You know, 5% of grade, nice, no homework. There's also permutations of this, of this uh, image series that are like, oh, open book quizzes, better buy the book. You know, things like that. So how do we start to incentivize these uh, positive behaviors? And in a bigger scale, how does that, um, us incentivizing positive behavior become showing the student good practices for when they're actually in this field if they're going to get into the field. And then the other thing that classes sometimes have going uh, against them is that um, sometimes they require out of class work that students aren't doing. You know, like going back to that reading, sometimes a lot of reading and, and knowledge is required, but they don't necessarily see it as something that they should be doing. They skip it or they are overwhelmed by it. So again, how can we uh, quantify that for them so that they understand what they're supposed to be doing? Well, I'm a game designer, so I'm going to, of course, address it with games. So a lot of what I'm uh, doing with game-related syllabi is based on the work of uh, teacher, game designer, and author Lee Sheldon in his book, The Multiplayer Classroom, uh, Designing Coursework as a Game. So everybody, take a look. Um, really good book, really horrible cover. Um, so a lot of it is derived from this. What he explores, though, are sort of the core elements of this. And then a lot is left to the interpretation of the actual reader. The main point of the book is his grading system. And we're going to get into that in a second. But he takes that as what we would call the core mechanic, is how the grade system, how he creates the grade system. And then, um, he does things that work for his pedagogy and his classes. Um, I've certainly tweaked it for my own purposes. And then this goes into uh, where I want to hear from you guys after the, the lecture <coughs> part. Um, what is it about your classes that you'd like to look into? And how could some of this fit into it? So let's go. Um, a quote from Jane McGonigal, who's a, a noteworthy game researcher and author. Um, she did, in, in her book, uh, Reality is Broken, How Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World, talks about um, why games work instead of real work at times. Specifically, how do games like World of Warcraft, which I pictured, um, get us to really engage in them? What is it about them that is better than real world work? Because if you look at a game like World of Warcraft, if anybody's ever played World of Warcraft, some of the tasks are actually pretty tedious and meaningless you know, if you were to tell them to somebody, but you get addicted to it. So why is that? This quote boils down to clear and immediate feedback, awareness of goals early on. Games are really good at this. They will make you aware of what you're supposed to do next. And then awareness of the quote unquote game state. So by doing these things, where are you? Where are you in the world? Where are you on the map? Where are you, you know, how far are you from becoming that level 15 dark elf rogue, um, you know, these are things that the game clue you into. You have to only click a key and suddenly all your statistics are in front of you. So again, here we go. Um, what games do, so here's your to-do list of quests. Here's your stat screen. These are not from World of Warcraft, they're from random selection of games. And then another thing that games are really good at is that they actually um, they pace tasks according to skill level. So here's two screenshots from the same classic Super Nintendo game. And one is very early on, you're fighting these three little blue goblins, and then one is the last boss of the game, spoiler alert for everybody. Um, 
where you're fighting this ginormous monster who can destroy universes. Um, obviously, you're not going to fight him at the beginning of the game. So, games are really good at this, but they're also really good at, you know, notice that the player character, this red-headed guy, um, he's alone in this screenshot, whereas in this one, he has a team accompanying him. So games are also really good not only at basing things on user level of expertise, but they're also really good at building some tasks for single users and building some tasks for multiple users. Um, whether that be through power of enemies or timed multitasking, sometimes it can be if you were to, if you have these three things to do and you have 20 minutes to do it, it's easier to do it with a team than with uh, one person. It kind of sounds like group work a little bit. Um, or, you know, collaborative tasks that require the expertise of multiple units. So games also uh, use tasks to mold social behavior. So contribution or lack co of contribution can be tracked easily. There's that group work thing again, the thing students hate, and they always hate it because there's that one person that doesn't do their work. That guy. So how do we eliminate or correct that guy's behavior? Um, another thing games are really good at is um, getting users to not only memorize, but also enact and, um, and uh, internalize really complex lore and systems. So uh, I tried to find the most obnoxious game information chart I could. This is from the game Pokemon. And long story short, it has a hidden underground system of Pokemon genes and DNA that you can maximize to become like a world champion among like actual players. Don't ask me to go over it, I have no idea what it is. Um, but people memorize and enact this on a regular basis. And imagine getting people excited to, you know, enact the things that actually go into your fields. And of course, games are popular. You know, if nothing else, games, uh, games inspire a lot of people to use them. So this is a shot from the, uh, the Smithsonian our, uh, video game exhibit that we had recently. Um, it was an indie arcade. So, so let's talk about building game syllabi real quick. I've got to hurry up uh, so we can talk. So designing games for real world purposes. Games have goals. Obstructions block us from goals. This is, uh, this is a, some text from our uh, director of the game lab. And means of overcoming obstruction to reach goals. So games have goals. What are the goals of classes? Problem to solve, knowledge to learn, or behavior you want your student to adopt. Obstructions, lack of knowledge, and needing the class to get credit. What are the means for achieving these goals? We've been doing it one way, but we saw that there are problems there. So when we design games, we use what are called game verbs. So things that we add, uh, we have players do to solve a problem. Is your problem that pig, uh, pig stole your eggs and then hid out in these uh, elaborate structures of different materials? Game verb, launch bird at pig. It's silly, but that's a game verb. So let's look at our class problem. So here's two of our class problems. Unclear grades an unclear grading criteria, but also that drowning feeling. Um, so if we look at the unclear grades, one thing that games have is that notion and awareness of character growth through leveling, quote unquote. So you do a bunch of battles, and this archer's experience goes up, and thus she becomes more powerful and valuable to your team. So what do we do in the classroom? Um, so here's the grading scale that I use. Welcome to class, you all have an F. I say that on the first day. I take a second to uh, see their reaction, and then I explain. Um, students are novice adventurers with zero experience points. Huh, that kind of sounds like real life, doesn't it? Um, points are awarded by completing tasks in and out of class. So there's stuff that you can do in class, like taking quizzes and such like uh, stuff like that, that give you points. Um, but you can also, you know, there's a list of tasks I'll give them, and I'll show that in a second, about, you know, um, that give you information on, or that you can do to get points. 
um, and bring it to class. They're unscheduled. That's another aspect of it. They're unscheduled. So you can just take them on on your own. Um, there's no way to lose points except not coming to class. So they cannot, they don't get that feeling of I'm at 100, now I'm at 80. They, they, when they reach a level, they're just there. Unle again, unless they don't come to class. Uh, and then point values correspond with letter grades. As you can see, I make them, I make C kind of difficult to get to, and then um, once they get to that average level, if they do extra work, they can get the A. Some classes I even uh, make it so that if you do only the required big projects, you can only reach C. So you have to do the extra work to get A. You can tweak that on your own. The checklist of tasks, well, that turns into this. This is a screenshot of my syllabus. Now this looks really complex, but the basic point here is that here's all your side quests. These are all things you could do. Read textbooks and send the professor discussion questions, 10 points per question. Uh, have, a, have a blog about this topic. You know, things that you would do as a game designer, because this is one of, from one of my game design classes, have a blog. That's a thing that good game designers do. They talk about game design and then the, they build knowledge in the field. Um, so you can actually add that to your, your syllabi, is these, uh, these sets of tasks. Um, incentivizing out of class learning, sometimes it seems like there's too much and then of course we have the lazy college senior here with his Guinness. Um, here's some quest examples that incentivize some of these behaviors. Uh, you can give a 10 minute uh, talk on a book and for 50 points. You can do a beginner tutorial for a piece of important software and get a lot of points. Um, you can repeat, you, know, you can do this multiple times, create art assets for games, you know? So in, translate into that, uh, that into your own group project. Um, you know, and then there's the, the send the study questions. So again, some of these tasks are even repeatable, so you can do them multiple times and get points for every time. Um, so here's that individual tasks versus team dynamic tasks. Sometimes I just make certain tasks too big for one student to accomplish, and thus they're required to do them in teams. Um, so one a popular, uh, you know, Western story structure is go find the seven things, and then once you get the seven things, you'll assemble Excalibur and then beat the giant ogre. Games use it all the time. Well, break down your final project into seven discrete pieces. Once those seven pieces are assembled by the adventurers, surprise, you have the final project. Um, and set those out as tasks. And then it becomes almost the rubric of what should your final project have to have you know, com, uh, to be completed. You know, and assign point values to them. Um, also, the other element of this is that you turn it into a team project where, okay, that person's a programmer, they can only do the programming piece, but they require uh, the artist's piece to make one of those seven constructs, you know. So you can break it down into all these different game-like mechanisms uh, that give, uh, students an idea of how, how uh, or, uh, excuse me, what you're expecting from uh, final projects. Um, I even, I, I've done away with the idea that everybody must know everything. Some of these problems are just too complex in classes. Um, and especially in my field, you have an expertise often. Um, you know, Mike can tell you, I can't program to save my life. Um, but I can draw lots of pretty pictures. So I add that to a team. So in, I've embraced um, individual specializations and allowed students to actually take on a job. I will give them a, uh, and this is for the extreme project-based courses. I even gave each job a separate list of tasks. You know, really long syllabus, but yes. So, so on that note, thinking about video game characters, right? Yeah. You would have uh, an artistry level Your programming level would be down low, and my archery might be down low. How how do you uh, how do you work that personally to, to get someone with say low artistry level up a little bit because their level is up a little bit? 
for programming what this class will say? Um, a lot of the quests for each individual class, we'll call it, actually require collaboration. So the collaboration will work together there. Um, and actually there is a, you know, and this is where it would turn into a whole workshop, but one syllabus I actually did, they had to do, uh, in order to figure out what their role was, especially for students that have never done one of these roles, they had to pick one in the first place. I said, you get 100 points if you try this, you know, this task for this role, this task for this role, and you do four of them, you know, for each role, and then they get to try it out, and then they can say, you know, I felt most comfortable doing that. Yeah. Um, so th you let them try it at the beginning. I called it the Trials of Destiny because I was teaching a game class, so I thought, let's, let's ham it up a little bit. Um, you know, so I actually had them enact that. Participation. Um, you know, same thing, I give them a discrete level uh, or discrete number of uh, tasks they can accomplish. Same thing with attendance. I'm actually kind of proud of my attendance policy. You gain 10 experience every time you come to class and you lose 20 every time you don't come to class. Um, you know, you can actually, again, there's no way to lose points in class, but this does incentivize people to actually show up because that bad habit will, will, uh, hurt you in the end. Again, solving our, our Leroy Jenkins problem. Um, and then among the group work as well, <coughs> I've actually implemented a, a quest where they have to rate each other. So the idea being that in a game plan, you're going to get kicked out if you don't, you know, you're going to either get kicked out or you're going to ruin your group's chances of beating a quest if you don't do what you're supposed to do. In this, exa uh, this specific example, this is a popular one in gamer lore. This is Leroy Jenkins. He's a World of Warcraft player. Um, he was away from the keyboard when his, his clan was coming up with like what they were going to do to fight this large party of enemies. And then he comes back and just charges into the room and they all get destroyed. So, um, you know, the idea being you can give people uh, this incentivizes good group behavior. You're still going to have a person that, that doesn't play ball, but um, you can get around by, by making the group dynamic part of your game mechanic. So benefits, real quick. Clear criteria for earning high grades. Um, one thing that I don't advertise to the students because it doesn't matter to them, I love it. It's very objective. You can say, well, you didn't do these, these five quests. It's great for teachers. Um, it, it points out very clearly what people did and did not do. Um, it encourages out-of-class learning by telling them what they have to do for out-of-class learning. That's a really tough part, is we want them to do out-of-class learning. They don't know what it is. They're not professionals in our field. You know, and I think that's something that, uh, as a professional, I forget is that I'm not you know, an 18-year-old who has all these other things on his mind. Um, so it encourages these out-of-class habits by telling you what they are and giving a point value to them. Um, it frees up class time for material in, um, by suggesting resources. So one thing that I also eliminated was uh, software tutorial. Is, is my class about, let's put it this way, I can teach software, but YouTube can also teach software. So my value isn't really... Um, my val if I'm teaching only that way, then all I have is the value of YouTube. You know, that's, that would be my value. So I, I tell them where those resources are outside of class, tell them they can get huge numbers of points for doing it. Oh, and it's, provide, or it's um, required for your final project to actually be able to do it. And then I can talk about the actual, you know, problem solving aspect of these, uh, these, these projects. And then, you know, it rewards students who put in the work. The downsides of it, students still don't always read syllabi. So if you notice my syllabus, it looks like a Dungeons and Dragons player manual. That's on purpose, because if it didn't, if it looked like an actual syllabus, and I say this from experience, because I've done the game syllabus as a Word document, they don't read it, because it's just that thing that they are going to put into their folder and never look at again because I'm there to explain it. I actually had a student ask me, hey, so what's the deal with all that extra credit? One time. Uh-oh. Um, so make sure your syllabus 
you either make it very clear, read this thing, or you, you know, make it somehow visually interesting so that they want to, they know it's different. Um, traditional cl uh, classroom content versus game. I'm still working this one out. Um, the idea of, I need to get up and lecture you, that can be very tough. Um, because once it starts to look at, it, if it walks like a classroom and talks like a classroom, it's a classroom. You're not, you're not in Middle Earth anymore. Um, so, things that I would say for future work, find ways to introduce game elements into your classrooms and uh, make sure your syllabus uh, is presented in some interesting fashion. So, uh, not a ton of time, we only have five minutes, but any questions or comments or discussion you want to have, I'm interested to hear what you run into. Yes? Okay, thank you for asking that because I didn't get time to explain it. Um, so that's really hard. Huh? Yes, yeah. That's really hard to actually quantify or, you know, to do as a teacher. It's like, oh my gosh, now I have all this work rolling in, especially the last couple weeks. What I do is every uh, last class of every week, I give them a sheet that is their character sheet. They write down what they did, show me proof that they did it, and then I take that character sheet and just, you know, I check mark what I've seen, and then I... Uh, record it. So I, I put the burden of proof on them, but it helps me, you know, instead of getting this massive pile of stuff, I have this nice sheet and I can just go through them. Um, I can also, um, if you guys follow me at uh, Totter87 um, on Twitter, I can also post a link to examples, because um, I can go post them on, on a website or something and then uh, you can download the PDFs. Any other, yeah? Uh, Yep. Do you test these? Do you change the syllabus during the course once you realize something is way off point? Yes. I've actually done that. Um, so I, I've released, last semester I had prepared the syllabus for low level students that assuming they weren't going to want to learn how to make a game and, and they actually wanted to learn how to make a game. So I printed out a, a expansion of the, the uh, rule book of sorts where it had a bunch of uh, game development so I've done that. Um, I usually have like some mid-semester check-in because yeah, you know, like I said, it's it's a game. I think of it like a game, but I think it requires play testing and bug fixing. So sometimes you got to do that midstream. But as long as you make it, make the students aware of it, um, then they're able to to adapt. Uh, so have you seen any um, um, so the the Sheldon book actually has a number of. A number of uh, case studies. One that I found in particularly uh, particularly useful was a high school bio class. She based her course on took away some of the game terminology. Again, I can ham it up because I am teaching game courses. Uh, they took away some of the game terminology, but you know, kept some of the mechanics of like, oh, today at the beginning of class you must go to one corner of the room and there is a you'll find a task. And then you can go do that task, and then your your responsibility is by this date do all the tasks in the room. Um, you know, uh, so that's a good example. A bad example was some like the teacher incentivized things, but because they didn't really know what, the students really didn't know what was going on, they didn't think it was important. So they could have actually used more game transparency. Um, and then I've actually incorporated. Um, I taught a gen ed in the art department last semester. I didn't do the game syllabi, but I did use some of my, um, so with draft, paper drafts, I I don't grade them as in like, you know, oh, you hand me a draft and I give you a C because it's not very good. I will give a flat out 100 points for it because it, it's about you giving me a uh, paper and letting me rate it. That's a, that's a game mechanic that I built for the game class. I, it worked great in a non-game class. So, I've injected a few small ones into other classes and they've worked really well. Yeah? So how do you deal with quality then? Like, you know, you have them send in a study question for 10 points or something. How do you make sure it's not just... I, uh, I do tell them it is based on my... my um, I will evaluate everything. And then 
you know, I base my evaluation on the level of the class, obviously. So if it's a freshman level class, uh, gen ed, you know, some of the regular questions, I, as long as it's a reasonable question that somebody's asking, you know, I'll give them the points for it. And if it's not, then I tell them why I didn't give them points. Um, you know, obviously, if it's a higher level class, I'm a little more of a stickler with that. I try to model my tasks around the outcomes I have for the course. So, you know, my the outcomes become the thing that they are working towards with the quests, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then one last question. Uh, did you have a question earlier? I didn't have a question earlier. Okay. Okay. Um, I've not gone into the character thing, so this is actually the, the high school biology example. This is where high school teachers, like K through 12 teachers, have an advantage over college teachers. They have a room with like their stuff in that room. We don't have that, so it's tough to incorporate characters of sorts. I, I've done a little bit of fiction, like with the you know wizards artifacts and all the 12 parts of the final project. I've done that, but that's really not. Um, in in a and this is the game mechanic thing that I want to work on. That that's like the next level. Is how do you then start building characters and fiction, like especially if you're a writer? Right? How do you maybe you share your uh, PowerPoint? Okay. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna post. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I can post um, a link, and then I'll just put the resources, and then I'll put some of my syllabi on on that link as well. Uh, cool. Thank you. Um, I'll be available outside for any. Discussions. I will also be downstairs uh, giving another talk on game research uh, with my trainer, Josh McCoy, these fine fellows, um, as part of the game lab. So uh, enjoy the day, and I look forward to working with you soon.